who at the time was chair of the Department of Anesthesiology at the University of Illinois College of Medicine. Dr. Candido went there for a fellowship, which he completed in 1988, and shortly thereafter, he returned to his roots on the East Coast, landing a position in the Department of Anesthesiology at Lenox Hill. Um, Dr. Candido, uh, fast forwarding, has published extensively on the uh, areas of acute and chronic pain management and to date has written more than 135 original peer-reviewed papers on a variety of topics related to controlling pain. He's also authored more than 85 textbook chapters on pain control, lectured to international audiences on the complex nature of pain and its treatment. Several of his works deal with finding appropriate solutions to dealing with painful conditions in patients who have underlying or atrogenic addictive diseases, which often blurs the distinction between therapy aimed at psychological ailments versus those des designed to combat psychological distress. So without further ado, Dr. Candido. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for the invitation to come here and speak in front of this um, fantastic group of individuals who are trying to learn new concepts in the business of pain from the National Spine and Pain Centers. Introduction, I have no financial relationships to disclose. I have some learning objectives. There are about basically five. The topic that I was asked to present is novel techniques in the management of post-traumatic stress disorder or syndrome. And in point of fact, we're gonna be talking a lot about not so novel techniques, but perhaps some novel applications. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about stellate ganglion block, but primarily about that, the history of the use of stellate ganglion blocks. Dr. Patel said some very interesting things to, to me when she described uh, persistent pelvic pain as having a relationship to complex regional pain syndrome. In some regards, PTSD does as well. And that's something that many of us didn't really conceptualize historically. We'll talk about the sympathetics, the anatomy, and the neuroscience behind the use of stellate ganglion blocks. PTSD is both a mental as well as behavioral disorder with a very high prevalence. Actually, about 6.8% of the United States population has PTSD at the present time. That's one in 15 people, meaning that in this very room there are probably some individuals silently sitting who have sustained PTSD. The, pre the incidence, meaning the new cases related to rape, for example, is almost 20%, and I suspect, as some studies suggest, it's even quite higher. Anything that's a threat to a person's life can give rise to post-traumatic stress disorder. Actually, we know about this dating all the way back to the ancient Greeks, but it was Silas Weir Mitchell, interestingly enough, who first described causalgia during the American Civil War, who also described classically the symptoms of PTSD, disturbing thoughts, feelings, dreams, attempt to avoid cues, and the activation of the sympathetic nervous system and the fight and flight response. It's a high risk of suicide with this condition. Self-harm, substance use are notoriously present in individuals who have PTSD. Individuals who have prolonged or sustained exposure to life-altering events may also have something known as complex PTSD, and to date we haven't had great therapies and great options to treat these individuals. You see them every day in your practice. Substantial proportion of individuals who come to you for chronic pain management will have some form of post-traumatic stress. Counseling, cognitive behavioral therapy has proven to be somewhat useful. Eye movement desensitization reprocessing is a novel therapy which is in its infancy. Uh, some medications, SSRIs, SNRIs, TCAs, have been more or less 50% effective. Do not use benzodiazepines, they are notoriously ineffective and lead to worsening depression and the risk for suicidality. And then there's the old stellate ganglion block, which we've known about for almost 100 years. In fact, the great Gaston Labatt mentions stellate ganglion block in his 1922-1923 uh, treatises known as the management of uh, regional anesthesia. So trauma causes an activation of the sympathetic nervous system, which leads to central sensitization, activation of wide dynamic range neurons in the fifth lamina of Brexit, very similar to the conceptualized hypothesis underlying complex regional pain syndrome or causalgia. In the urine, we see high concentrations of norepinephrine and epinephrine. We see low serotonin. Abnormally, we see an abnormal insula, amygdala, hippocampus, and of course, these can be verified using functional MRI studies. There's actually a reduction in the volume of the amygdala in individuals with PTSD. 
there's a, re a reduction in anandamide, which is an endo endogenous cannabinoid in patients who have PTSD. One of the papers that I was privileged to co-author, I've worked extensively with Eugene Lipov. Eugene Lipov is one of my professional partners. Gene was the first person in 2008 to describe the use of stellate uh, ganglion blocks in a a pedestrian or civilian population. Sean Mulvaney was the first person in 2010 to describe it in a civilian population. But Crystal had stated that there was an urgent need to find effective pharmacological treatments for PTSD, and that's true. Considering that PTSD with a 6.8% prevalence is a national health priority. However, we went back and suggested why not use a tried and true methodology, the stellate ganglion block, first described in 1924 and popularized by, the, popularized by the great Daniel Seymour from the Virginia Mason Medical Center in uh, Virginia. One of our papers published uh, in 2021 talked about the, uh, actually the physiological changes that occur in PTSD. And this is the underlying premise for why a stellate ganglion block or a sympathetic block might prove useful for individuals with PTSD. Brain-derived neurotrophic factor is increased in PTSD, this leads to an augmentation or methyl methylation of DNA. Methylation of DNA leads to an increase in nerve growth factor in the brain. These are all studied in animals, and this has been proven to be true in individuals who have sustained trauma, who have a PTSD type of condition. If you can reduce beta nerve growth factor, you may reduce the production of norepinephrine levels in the brain, and reducing that may lead to less sprouting. These are all concepts that Nordenbus, about 40 or 50 years ago, discussed in reference to the etiology for complex regional pain syndrome or reflex sympathetic dystrophy at the time. The theoretical mechanism, therefore, for the use of sympathetic block is to reduce nerve growth factor, reduce sympathetic nerve growth, reduce sprouting, reduce secondarily norepinephrine levels in the brain, and by changing DNA methylation, by uh, reducing DNA methylation or demethylizing the DNA, what we find is a reduction in sympathetic sprouting, which reverses many of the changes associated with PTSD. This is Dr. Lipoff's theory. He proposed this as early as 2010, that some type of traumatic event leads to an increase in brain-derived neurotrophic factor and nerve growth factor in the brain, causing a surge of norepinephrine concentrations, both centrally as well as peripherally, migrating down towards the stellate ganglion, the cervical sympathetic ganglion, this can cause an activation of the wide dynamic range neurons, central sensitization in the fifth lamina of Rexid. A stellate ganglion block reduces nerve growth factor, de decreases sprouting, similar to conceptualizing what we have thought about CRPS uh, for many, many years or decades. And this reduces nerve growth factor, which results in decrease in sprouting and norepinephrine. There's also changes as seen in functional MRIs in the amygdala. This was published at first as an abstract at the ASA in 2015 by Al Kair and Associates, and now is undergoing further investigation. So pre stellate ganglion block in individuals with PTSD, there's activation of the amygdala. With longer standing PTSD, there's a reduction in the volume. And then you can study this functionally over time in individuals six months, one year, two years, following stellate ganglion blocks you can see that there's a reduction in the high intensity activation of the amygdala. I have to reference Dr. Daniel Moore. I think Dr. Patel said something very telling. To understand, you have to understand the past, to understand the present. Daniel C. Moore was a, a tremendous educator. He was the chief of anesthesia at the Virginia Mason Medical Center in Seattle. He wrote four books as a single author with no contributors. He wrote Regional Anesthesia, Complications of Regional Anesthesia, he wrote in 1954 a complete text dedicated to stellate ganglion block, and then he wrote obstetrical anesthesia. This is myself with Daniel Moore in 2007. He passed in 2015. And Danny knew all about stellate ganglion block. He knew that it had profound effects on affect, on mood, on depression, and he published this in his work of 1954. But if you want a great history, a historical vignette, uh, Dr. Mary Summers published the treatment of the use of uh, stellate ganglion blocks for PTSD. This is a great review article from 2017. And this shows the history. In 47, when Danny Moore was getting ready to write his book on stellate block, he talked about the euphoria in patients who were treated for neurological indications. He also talked about production of, of alterations in mood and affect, especially in elderly patients with psychosis and dementia. And it wasn't until about 2008 when Lipov and Associates rediscovered the use 
the ameliorating effects on psychological parameters in patients with PTSD. And then Mulvaney looked at this in the military population. Here's the timeline. Lipoff in 2008 used still a gangland block for a pedestrian population of individuals, for civilians. Then Mulvaney in 2010 published it in the Army. Hickey published it in the Navy. Individual sailors who had PTSD, the use of stellate ganglion blocks. And then going forward from 2013 to the present time, there's been an explosion of articles on the use of stellate ganglion block. Now you'll see the article, the cartoon here, shows a right-sided stellate ganglion block. And while it might be axiomatic to say, well, you can use either a left or a right-sided stellate block for PTSD, in point of fact, most investigators use a right-sided stellate ganglion block for PTSD, and there are some physiological reasons why that is so. This is from Danny Moore's 1954 book. Remember, the stellate ganglion represents the confluence of the inferior cervical and the first thoracic uh, sympathetic ganglion in about 80% of individuals, typically found at Chassignac's tubercle, typ typically measuring between 0.8 to 1.2 centimeters in its aggregate length. Here's a picture from Danny's book. You can see in the old days, we used a palpation te te technique. We retracted the sternocleidal mastoid muscle laterally. We went down until we tapped the transverse process, and then we retracted our needle to clear the prevertebral fascia and to be outside of the longest coli muscle and then injected a very small aliquot of local because even a quarter cc will, can produce a grand mal seizure. Obviously, the advent of uh, the use of ultrasound and other fluoroscopic imaging has altered dramatically the complication rate. The beauty of ultrasound guidance is that, uh, unlike what Danny Moore taught us, that every time you do a stellate block, you're doing a thyroid biopsy. That's no longer the case when you use ultrasound guidance, because you can see the trachea, the esophagus, transverse process, thyroid, sternocleidomastoid muscle. And as we move from medial to lateral, you can see not only here the stellate ganglion, this was one of my patients who had a BMI of 18, a very slender young lady with PTSD that we treated. You can see the vasculature, you can avoid it. This is a fluoroscopic imaging showing the same relative anatomical constructs. Again, absent the soft tissues because clearly with fluoro you don't see them. So why do we choose a right-sided stellate ganglion block? Well, because the heart rate variability with a right-sided stellate ganglion block is decidedly less than that observed with a left-sided stellate ganglion block. This was published in Regional Anesthesia Pain Medicine in 2004 and subsequently validated by a study in 2010 by an author named Kim. But you can see that intraocular pressure is reduced by even small volumes injected at C7. Stellate ganglion block reduces vascular tone. And of course, with a right-sided block, there's a minimal effect on heart rate and blood pressure. Although there is an elevation or an increase in the QT interval, we don't see that with a left-sided block. This is the seminal work in a relatively obscure journal by Dr. Kim and Associates that looked at heart rate variability and found profound changes with left-sided stellate ganglion block in 89 patients. Half of them got a right-sided block, half of them got a left-sided block, almost no variability at all with the right-sided block. This is your narrator, that's myself, performing a right-sided stellate ganglion block using fluoroscopic imaging. By and large, in my practice, I, I typically use ultrasound guidance. This was an individual who actually had a lot of experience who asked me to use a fluoroscopy for this technique. So Sean Mulvaney, who's done a tremendous amount of work on the use of stellate block for PTSD in the military population, has suggested an algorithm for how you manage this condition. First, performing right-sided stellate ganglion blocks up to two times separated by a week apart in individuals with PTSD. And if there's no value, consider doing a left-sided stellate ganglion block. Lipoff and I and others went back and looked at this in our own series of patients, 205 consecutive patients who failed to derive benefits from a right-sided stellate ganglion block, and we found that in about 50% of those individuals who failed to derive benefit with the right-sided block, they did derive benefit with the left-sided block. So it's not to say don't do a left-sided stellate for PTSD, but in point of fact, right side is considered the approach utilized at the forefront in the management of this condition. Is there any level one evidence to suggest that stellate ganglion block is effective for PTSD versus control? Yes, here's another nice paper from Mulvaney and Associates. A large group of individuals with PTSD who had stellate ganglion blocks performed on the right side two weeks apart. And there's about, a, 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 you can see that there was a, a 12.6 point reduction in severity scores over the eight week follow up period when stellate ganglion blocks were used versus a sham procedure, which only produced a, a reduction in 6.1 points in individuals who had saline injection into the subcutaneous tissues. What about the utility of cervical sympathetic block or stellate ganglion block? 
uh, in treating post-traumatic stress disorder and cohorts. This was our paper that we published just this year, Dr. Lipoff and myself. We looked at individuals in the military population. We looked at the individuals in a civilian population. Very, very large group. We had almost 500 consecutive patients, 327 patients met the inclusion criteria. And we had patients, uh, males who were in the military, males who were in the civilian population, females who were in the military, and females who were in the civilian population who underwent stellate ganglion blocks for PTSD. There was a statistical reduction in PCL scores across the board in males and in females with a greater reduction in severity scores according to the DSM-4. We used a little bit of an older nomenclature, especially in females and especially in the military population, regardless of suicidality, regardless of the use of opioids, regardless of the severity of their symptoms, regardless of the underlying etiology for what led them to have PTSD. Our conclusion was that a cervical sympathetic block seems to be effective for PTSD, irrespective of gender, irrespective of trauma type. And we had 21 different types of trauma that led to PTSD, drug use, suicidality, or the age of the individuals. Lipoff and I have also studied the use of stellate ganglion blocks for a whole host of, of relatively unrelated conditions, including this paper we published now two years ago on immunologically linked disorders, because we know that stellate ganglion block affects not only the amygdala, but also the thymus and the production of T cells with serious inflammatory immunological conditions. So stellate ganglion block is now being expanded in its uh, scope of what it might be useful for for you and your uh, respective pain practices. I'll finish up by pointing out some of the earlier classical papers on the use of stellate ganglion blocks for sympathetically mediated, not sympathetically mediated pain, for the sympathetically activation associated with PTSD. Here's a, one of the first papers by my colleague, Dr. Lipoff. Here's one of our, our uh, articles. And the reason I, I included Lipoff's paper here was because he said that you could use pulsed radio frequency for individuals who showed a transient benefit to stellate ganglion block, but not a persistent benefit. It's also been described in the literature to use uh, endoscopic second thoracic sympathetic vertebra clipping for individuals who had a, a transient benefit from stellate ganglion block, but not a persistent benefit from stellate ganglion block. Here's one of Mulvaney's earlier papers, a, considered a classic paper published in the military medicine. Here's some of the earlier papers in 2013 and 2012 by Lipoff and Associates about the use of not only reducing the subjective discomfort of PTSD, but also reducing suicidality and improving memory, because there's a, the amygdala, of course, and the hippocampus have profoundly been affected by PTSD, and reversing that can improve not just the symptoms, but also memory and functionality. So in conclusion, the prevalence of PTSD is quite high, almost 7%. The incidence of PTSD in some types of trauma, including things like rape, approaches 20 or even 25%. A right side is still a ganglion block should be used as your first line therapy for PTSD, but remember our, our paper, in 205 papers, we did find success and efficacy with left-sided blocks as well. Psychological support is a critical component. This is a mental and psychological disorder associated with abnormal functioning of the central nervous system to trauma. Thoracic T2 endoscopic clipping is an alternative therapy, as is pulsed radio frequency for individuals who've sustained only a transient benefit to the use of stellate block, and medical management, of course, should be used as adjunctive therapy. Thank you for your time and attention, and thank you, Dr. Salim.